<clears throat> so last week we talked about engaging culture. We talked about the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28 that Jesus gave us, not the great suggestion, right? Where it's like, well, if you're in the mood to share the good news on how sinners can be saved, go for it. If you're the extrovert and you have some extra time on your hands and you want to share the good news of how souls can be made right with God, sinful souls can be made right with God, go for it. It's not the great suggestion. Nor is it the great mission where he says, hey, you're going to be paddling upstream while the current of the world is going in an opposite direction. What you call light, they call dark. What you call dark, they call light. What you call sweet, they call bitter. What you call bitter, they call sweet. And as you're going upstream, here's your mission. Godspeed. No, it's not the great suggestion, and no, it's not the great mission, meaning that it's something that is up to us and that we have to do it in our own strength. It's the great co-mission, where God's doing the work. God's making the waves, and he loves us so much that he actually wants to tag each and every one of us into the game to actually surf the waves with him. But it's not us making the waves. That would be the great mission. It's the great co-mission. He is doing it. That's why I love the last verse in Mark's gospel when it says the disciples went out preaching the gospel, the Lord working with them. That's why the book of Acts should actually be called not the Acts of the Apostles, because remember the titles of the biblical books are not inspired. The word of God is inspired, but the titles were added later, just like chapters and verses uh, were added later. The title Acts should actually be the Acts of Jesus Christ or the Acts of the Holy Spirit through surrendered vessels, but it's not the Acts of the Apostles. Obviously, people meant well when they gave the title, but Jesus is doing the work and he's called us to labor with him. That's why it's a co-mission, co-working together. As we go out, we're going out into a world of cultures. Going back to the Tower of Babel, where we see the dispersion and the confusion of languages, we just see cultures and cultures and subcultures. And with the Word of God as our authority and our guide, we go to cultural contexts. We go out to reach people. We're called to go and inject ourselves into the culture, becoming all things to all men, using the scripture as our guide, right? And then bringing the counter-cultural message of what life really is. The counter-cultural message of what peace really is. The counter-cultural message of what safety and salvation really is. The counter-cultural message of truly, that answers origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. We talked last week about the pitfalls that the church falls into. Where... The church does not engage culture, and hence the church is not salt to a bland world and is not a light to a dark world, but actually just people within four walls. We talked about cultural aversion. Um, and a lot of this comes down to biblical illiteracy in the pulpit, and a lot of it comes down to believers just not knowing their word because it takes work to navigate a culture, whether we're talking about any culture, an indigenous culture, uh, a, a, a new age culture, a uh, hip hop culture, corporate culture, uh, you name it, entertainment culture, it takes work to navigate a culture, but more than the work and the labor of love, it takes a scriptural knowledge to be able to read that culture through the scriptures. So because so many really don't understand God's love for the world, so many really forget the own pit they got taken from. Cultural aversion becomes this easy scapegoat where it's easy to write off the whole world as going to hell in a handbasket and hey, if I responded to Jesus, they can too. And basically, you want to stay away from everything cultural and it's easy to just label everything as ungodly, 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 ungodly. That is cultural aversion. What cultural aversion does is it turns people off to the church. Because the church doesn't look relevant, the church doesn't look real, and the church doesn't look like a light because Jesus said no one lights a candle and then puts a bushel bucket on it upside down. The second one is cultural indifference, where there are just those that just feel no need to look at any form of culture, and they leave it at that. And a lot of people are culturally averse 
Because the third pitfall is cultural accommodation. We talked about this last week. Where some churches want to be so relevant, so cool, so hip, that they literally jump on any cultural bandwagon uh, just in the name of showing that they're cutting edge. Uh, the problem with cultural accommodation is you're becoming a chameleon now. You're no longer holding to truth. You lose your distinction. Uh, you're no longer salt. You're just sand, acting like sand in the midst of sand. Well, the thing is, so many people are afraid of cultural accommodation. That's why a lot of churches just decide to be culturally averse, because they're saying, well, hey, to get involved is to be accommodating. So usually the culturally averse Christians, they're also usually your biggest critics of the ones who are engaging culture. And even if you are engaging culture correctly, they're accusing you of being a chameleon. The bottom line is this. Jesus was born into a cultural context. Jesus entered culture. Even when Jesus sent the disciples out, what did he say? When you enter a home, as I share you out all throughout the region, eat whatever's put in front of you. What is Jesus saying with that? You're entering a home, you're entering a cultural context, engage the culture. Don't go in there with a menu of what you can eat and what you can't eat, where you're coming in and in the name of being distinct, you're just completely culturally averse. You don't know what's going to be thrown in front of you. Eat whatever is set in front of you. You're entering it, you're learning to engage culture to become all things to all men. The next one is cultural appropriation. That's another pitfall the church falls into where you literally are just putting a band-aid on it and just throwing a Jesus fish and a Jesus, in Jesus' name over it, and it just takes away the work that needs to be done of reading the culture through the scriptures. And then another pitfall is cultural takeover. That is what a lot of colonizing Christianity did, where it comes on the scene and basically is... We come with this culture, we're replacing completely that culture, we're replacing completely indigenous culture, we're not looking at anything, drums, face paint, any form of expression, it's a takeover, you know, and sanctification will look like you now beginning to dress like you're from this side of town, and now no longer will it be animal skins, it will now be suspenders and bow ties, and if you have that, you're actually called cultured, that also speaks of cultural superiority. The bottom line is when you look at the Bible it says a lot about culture and equips us on how to engage culture. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, I become all things to all men. To those that are without law, I don't come in talking about the Old Testament prophets and Jesus fulfilling scripture. I talk about God as the creator that gives everyone food on their table. He says, to those with the law, I come and share as those that understand the Old Testament scriptures. To those who are weak, I share my testimonies of where I was weak and God met me. I become all things to all men. He says this, for the gospel's sake. You have to underline that in 1 Corinthians 9 because what we're doing is for the gospel's sake. It is only for the purpose of being able to redeem that moment when the door is open to share Christ. We talked last week about cultural illiteracy being a huge problem in the pulpit. Because there's cultural aversion in the pulpit, of course it's going to produce congregants who are culturally averse. We need to know the culture around us. We talked last week about how you can't apply the Bible to something you can't understand. And we looked at Acts 17, where Paul goes into Athens and takes the time to actually engage and learn the culture. We talked last week about the humility that's necessary to actually learn a culture. Because you're admitting you don't know everything. You're admitting, yeah, you have the message. You have the true message of how a soul can be made right with God. And that there's no other name under heaven that could save a soul except for the name of Jesus Christ. Not because the preacher says so. Not because church history says so. Because Jesus said so. Because the word of God says so. But we see how even in the midst of that, when we step into a cultural context, we have to be a learner. And a lot of believers, though we have the big answer, capital A, do not want to take the time and show the humility to have to learn some of the lowercase a answers to how a culture and a people operate. So a lot of times you got believers walking away not even realizing how much they've completely offended a person from a culture, completely spoke in absolute ignorance on issues uh, and things that, and they're, because their culture says it's okay, you know, that's cultural illiteracy. 
And then meanwhile, it's all about, well, you know, it's up to the Lord. And then everything gets drawn on the sovereignty of God. When in the reality is, we're not really following. We're not as biblical as we realize at times when it comes to engaging culture. I really recommend you listen to last week's message where Paul goes to Athens, takes the time to learn their culture, in learning their culture, sees the open door of how he can take a place they were stumbling on and bring it to the forefront and place Christ there. That's no different than when I go to Alaska. And the biggest fear in Alaska is the Kushtaka, the evil realm, the land otter people, shapeshifters with real stories of shapeshifters where this person who's not even on social media tells an account of what happened at the beach and it's the very same experience that happened across the island and the two people don't know each other. So when you get to learn a culture and in our culture talking about the devil and evil, in mainstream culture, that's kind of considered, uh, I don't know, you know, your Friday the 13th stuff. Let's talk about something else, right? So in our culture, we tend to look at things like maybe origin. We talk about maybe the meaning of life, purpose, success, uh, you know, what God gauges that at. When we get to study an indigenous culture, in particular Alaska, it was the evil realm that actually, just like Paul noticed in Athens, the statue to the unknown God, and in learning the culture, in becoming culturally literate, he then was able to see how he could present Christ. He first took the time to be a student, even though he was a sent teacher from God. The same way in Alaska, in studying the Kushtaka, I realized, here is the answer, Colossians 2.15. Now I get to present how Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and how he was manifested to destroy the works of the devil and the kushtaka. The fear there is so strong that they believe you can't even say kushtaka three times without something bad happening. I've seen manifestations there. But when they see someone able to stand and proclaim and proclaim and proclaim and then they see you still wake up the next morning and they see that you still went out and caught a fish and that your boat didn't get flipped and in the fog that mysteriously set in, you came out of the fog. You understand what it's about? It's about reaching a people, engaging a culture, saturating a culture with our love and with our sincerity and then buying up an opportunity to share Christ. So... This is just review, but look, it's so nice. We got to say it twice because, again, we'll have people sitting in pews that are amen in this to death. And then, boom, the minute we bring another culture into our doors, people will stumble at it. Even going to a Bible believing church, we talked last week, there's a lot more cultural aversion in every person than they realize. No, you're not averse to the culture you grew up in. Let someone play some old stuff from your day, some old music from your day. All of a sudden, there you have all the cultural understanding in the world. But let it be some new music. Let it be some mumble rap. All of a sudden, I don't know. But let them play your stuff. And the ones that listen to mumble rap think that your stuff is, is mumbles, whatever. You know, you get my point. The bottom line is we are to reach people. We are to engage culture. And it is to buy up opportunity to share Christ. Now... Where am I going with all of this and how does this usher into the, us into the Beatitudes? It ushers us into the Beatitudes because if we're going to be his ambassadors, if we're going to be his, his sent ones to engage culture, to saturate culture, and then to bring this countercultural message, you know, that is relevant. Because again, truth never changes. Let someone get this message twisted. I make y'all repeat it, but it doesn't feel like that kind of day. Truth never changes, but how we translate and communicate the faith changes and is adapted for different cultural contexts. I just gave that example. The go- it's always the gospel, but in the Alaska indigenous context, it's the gospel in the context of the Kushtaka, oh, and by the way, man's ultimate problem of sin. With the Athenian philosophers, it was another way. It's all about reaching that dimension, but it's all about sharing Christ. So we go to the Beatitudes now because the Beatitudes, you've heard of that, right? Matthew chapter 5, he gives the Beatitudes. It's in Christ's Sermon on the Mount, right? We've got to be the right kind of people if God is going to use us. Because, yo, you you can have all of this downloaded to your intellect right now. But if your heart is not in line with Christ's heart, You could sit here and know all of this information and be ineffective. Ineffective. Frog on a log. Just another intellectual Christianity, a tadpole Christian, all head, no body. Right? 
So the Beatitudes comes in because it's there to adjust our attitude. And I don't know about you, but we need regular attitude adjustments. You ever say to a kid, like, yo, you need an attitude adjustment. It, it, what it's saying is you don't just need to be corrected on this one thing. You don't just need to be reminded, you know, to give a firm handshake or just be reminded to make better eye contact or just be reminded to say please and thank you instead of yeah to that person, you know, whatever. You need an attitude adjustment. Y'all ever feel like that? Or no, only believers in Delaware, only believers in, in Maryland. Does that happen in, in Philly? <laughs> Philly more than anywhere else, right? Philly's attitude central. Bottom line is this. The Beatitudes are here to give us an attitude adjustment. The Beatitudes are about character. The Beatitudes are about when you have the knowledge, you know the pitfalls. I got to beware of cultural aversion. I've got to beware of cultural indifference. I got to beware of cultural accommodation. I got to beware of cultural appropriation. I've got to beware of cultural takeover where I'm still walking in a lot of the ignorance of a, of a colonizing Christianity, which Jesus, by the way, completely, completely wrote off as wolves in sheep's clothing and what have you, and the Galatian gospel, heresy, when you're preaching Christ and anything else. That's another sermon. But if I'm going to be used by God in all of this, it really comes down to looking like Jesus. Would you write this in your notes? God blesses what looks like him. He blesses what looks like him, and the Beatitudes come along to make sure that we don't just talk like him, but that we actually look like him. The Beatitudes are about character, all right? Before we go there, let's look at the backdrop. You ready for the backdrop? Here's the backdrop. When Jesus came on the scene, the religious rulers of that day were walking in all of the above. Cultural aversion, cultural takeover, not cultural accommodation because what they had was where it was. They weren't budging. They were speaking with no power, no fragrance of heaven. Instead of building up, when they spoke, it broke people down. Now do you see why Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Because many today can even walk in that same way. It was basically dead religion. Jesus comes on the scene and revolutionizes it and brings back joy, brings back excitement, brings back the reality of actually knowing God as your best friend and joy and that heart work is actually a good thing, not something uh, to actually turn into some weird thing. And when he does this, he begins it with the Sermon on the Mount. Let's look at the backdrop here. If you go to Luke chapter 6 and you look at verse 12, Preceding this day where he gives this sermon, one of his most famous sermons, the Sermon on the Mount. Preceding that day, it says in Luke 6 verse 12, what did he do the night before? It says, it came to pass in those days, he went into a mountain to pray and prayed all night to God. Then it says, verse 13, when it was daytime, he called his 12 disciples and named them his apostles. It goes on to list them. Then verse 17 of Luke 6 says, and he came down with them and stood in the plain. And basically it's believed, and I've stood in this area in both my trips to Israel. It is the northern part of the Sea of Galilee where basically... It's just a hill leading beautifully down to the water and almost becomes like a natural amphitheater uh, where you don't even need to put in benches because it just slopes that beautifully. And here it's calling that a plain. So it says, coming down with them, he stood in the plain with the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people from Judea, Jerusalem, from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude, verse 19, sought to touch him because there went virtue out of him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger, um, for you will be filled. Let's now go to Matthew chapter 5. Doesn't that add beautiful context to what we read in Matthew 5? That it wasn't just Christ sharing this 
revolutionizing, soul-stirring, um, dead religion banishing, um, outcast inviting message that leveled the playing field. But look at the context. Before he did it, he prayed all night, chose his disciples, knew Judas would be a devil because he said that, but knew the scriptures had to be fulfilled in what he came to do. And that doesn't this sound like our Jesus? Doesn't this add a lot more HD to it? Not only is he delivering this message where they were used to hearing an orator speak and a crowd would gather many times for the wrong reasons, but what did Luke just fill us in on in Luke 6? That he's actually healing everybody in the midst of breaking all this down. He's showing the power in his word by bringing healing, delivering. How can this person hear if they're plagued with demons and running around in some schizophrenic frenzy? He's setting people free just so they can get the word. Do you know our Lord is still like that? We can come to church, all kinds of tore up from the floor up, and he literally is doing that hard work in the car on the way over here. Might just be with the hug someone gives you on the way in, the worship experience, which is why we have to pray for our worship team and be so thankful for them. But he does that same work now, knowing how can this person whom I love and whom I died for get this message when their head is all jacked up right now, when their heart is all messed up right now, when this wound on him is gaping. He's still the same Lord. How many of you guys appreciate that now? Like, it changes it a lot more from in our minds. We're just used to the orator speaking, who's just really not touching anyone, but still is impactful. No, Luke 6 makes it clear. People are grabbing them, reaching all over, and virtue is going out of them. People are getting healed. It says he healed everybody. No wonder Jesus would go to sleep. No wonder Jesus slept on a boat, even in the middle of a storm. Fully God, yet fully human. Hungered, real hunger, was worn out from a real hard day's work. Sweat, great drops of blood in the garden because of the stress he was under. When he said, Father, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will but thine. But this adds a lot more. So now let's go to Matthew 5. And hopefully even that reading, what it should do is <clears throat> allow you to realize, you know what this message is for me. Maybe someone here, you needed to know. Because look. The Sermon on the Mount is heavy. He's talking about what it looks like to look like him. <laughs> and you read that, blessed are the peacemakers. And you might be like, man, I don't, <laughs> I watch fights. I watch fights on Facebook when I see fights. <laughs> How can I, <laughs> I, I'm not no, I, I haven't been a peacemaker. You know what I mean? When I, when I see a fight, I stop the car and look because I'm curious and nosy. Man, so yeah, you can read the Sermon on the Mount and literally just start to beat yourself down where reading this doesn't fill you with a hope. Reading this actually just shows you just how whack you are. But you see, that's why I appreciate looking at Luke 6. What is he doing while he's teaching? Healing. What is he doing while he's teaching? Giving people the strength. Do you realize... In this day, they had made religion into something where you did it in your own strength, where you patted yourself on the back, where you popped your collar. It was about what rabbi you were with, what rabbinic school you were with. It was all about who you knew. It, they turned it into a corporate thing. What he's coming to do is he's coming to remind people what it really means to be spiritual, one, and two, to show how high the bar is, and then three, to show that you cannot do any of this without relying on Jesus. He came to reinstate dependency on God, humility, admitting you don't have it all together. All of the stuff that actually equals blessings, that promotion does come from God, that it don't come from you. He is literally revolutionizing everything and ripping, just as we would rip up an old rug, he's ripping everything up and laying down the true golden heavenly road. So Matthew 5, it says, seeing the multitudes. Now, just by what we read, now doesn't your mind have so much HD? Because he didn't just see the multitudes. He was getting hugged. He was touching. He was healing. He was casting out devils. Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and taught them. Why does Matthew give you so much more of what Jesus said? Remember, Matthew's focusing on what Jesus said. Mark's focus is more on what Jesus did. Luke's focus is more on what Jesus felt. 
John's focus was more on who Jesus was as God Almighty, the creator of everything visible and invisible, the one who was and is and is to come, the Alpha and the Omega. That's why Luke just gives you a few verses about it, but gives you how Jesus felt. He's healing people, rejoicing with people. It's Matthew that's going to give you more of what Jesus said. Do you get it now? That's how we appreciate all four Gospels. Let's go. And he says this, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed, verse 4, are they that mourn. Blessed, verse 5, are the meek. Blessed, verse 6, are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. He gives 10 beatitudes here. What's amazing is that on another mountain, 10 commandments were given at Mount Sinai. The old covenant was ushered in by 10 commandments at Mount Sinai. Here, the new covenant. He's basically flinging the doors of heaven wide open. Again, the religious rulers of that day had a lot of people thinking heaven could never be a place for them. They didn't fit in. Too dirty, too foul, not smart enough, didn't memorize enough Bible. They had made it into this man-centered, man-worshiping thing. What does Jesus come and do? He just flings the doors wide open and he gives 10 beatitudes. That's why he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, don't think I've come to destroy everything in the Old Testament. I'm just coming to fulfill it all. The Old Testament prepared people for the New Testament. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. The Ten Commandments were ten pointer fingers designed by God to define sin and point at your heart saying you need a savior. The wages of sin is death. The only solution for you is God's provision for forgiveness. Once you give your life to Jesus though, the Ten Commandments become ten friends. Ten friends designed to keep you on the path of blessing and designed to keep your character in line with the character of God. So again, let's really look at the beauty of God's harmony with how in the Old Testament it was ten commandments. Now Jesus comes, flings the doors wide open with ten beatitudes. Blessed actually comes from the Latin word beatus. Beatus is where we get the word beatitudes. So whenever you see blessed, put in beatus. B-E-A-T-B-E-A, beatus. B-E-A-T-U-S. Beatus was a word, a Latin word that the Romans believed was a happiness that only the gods could experience. They believed it was such a divine happiness, such a happiness of such immovable peace, such indescribable joy that they said only the Roman gods can experience this. So now can you imagine in a day of just dead religion and predictable churchianity, Jesus comes along and while people actually began to equate being spiritual with looking sad all the time, you see some people like that today. They equate spirituality with always looking like they're so serious about everything, so serious that they can't even talk to you. You know, in this day, Jesus comes, flings the doors wide open. We've all been wired for joy, right? Wired for it, even with little kids. That's why they had the little kid, you could throw them in the air 10 times. They, they, they'll let you do it until literally you rip both rotator cuffs. We're wired for joy. And we're wired for a joy that the little kid is not, never heard a little kid say, you know what, don't do this anymore. It might get played out. We're wired for a joy. You see it from a young We're wired to receive love. That's why you never see a little baby just smack your hand away when you're trying to give it affection. Oh, what was the baby's first gesture? Smack me for, for, for just, you know, giving it love? No, that, the baby's drinking it in. We're wired for this because all of us are made in mego dei, in the image of God. Jesus comes and just flings the doors wide open and says, happiness, remember that concept? It's real. Joy, remember that concept? It's real. And while the world's out there convincing you that happiness is found somewhere else, your own heart's trying to go after the bait like it's somewhere else, he comes and says, the happiness that the Romans believed only the gods can experience it, it's all in me. Blessed, beatus, are the poor in spirit. What he means there is those that have a, not only a right estimation of who they are, but who realize that in and of themselves, they can't do anything right. They know they're sinners. They're not living their life trying to convince themselves in the world that they're not a sinner. They know they're sinners. 
They know that as sure as a leopard has spots, that they have been tainted with original sin. That's why you don't have to teach little kids to do bad. You have to teach them not to do bad. You don't have to teach them to be selfish, to snap back, uh, and to hit. You have to teach them not to do those things, even when they've never seen anyone do it. The Bible says a child is but a few moments old and already full of trouble. We've inherited that from Adam and Eve. He says the gateway to this kind of happiness is admitting that you don't have it all together. That's why Jesus said, as a physician, I haven't come to call the righteous. I've come for the sick. Because in reality, it is a world where everyone is sick, where everyone is S-I-N positive. So this happiness begins with having a sober estimation of yourself and realizing that in and of yourself, you're, you're, you, you need everything from him. Here's the reality, though. And here's what you see happening in the church a lot. Everyone begins this way because you don't call on Jesus until you are poor in spirit. You don't call on Jesus until you realize that you're spiritually bankrupt and you are a beggar um, providing the sinner and that he is a savior. But what can end up happening is believers start getting real blessed. Real blessed. Real strong. You used to always be last for kickball. You used to always be last for dodgeball. No one wanted you to sit at their table at lunch uh, when you went to school. But now everybody wants you at their table. Now, somehow you learn how to play kickball. And you actually are the best in dodgeball. He done, the Lord done made you, even though it's an 80s game, he done made you dodgeball king. It just happened. But what can happen is, like Ezekiel 16, with all these blessings, you began as poor in spirit. You began with the daily language of God. I can't do it without you. You began with the kind of person asking others' opinion. Yo, how's my heart? Yo, do I ever come off cocky? Do I ever come off prideful? Like, I don't trust my own heart. You began poor in spirit, but through all the blessings, you're not poor in spirit anymore. You actually have an answer for everything. No need to confer with anyone, no need to even fellowship because you're, you're, you're like a one-man band. You have, you have every instrument, you play every instrument, you used to talk to people, love the idea of just being able to, you know, in the multitude of counsel, now you're a one-man band. You play ukulele, harmonica, accordion, and everything. So you're not poor in spirit anymore. Does that mean you lose your salvation? No, but you lose that beatus. You lose that beatus. You lose that happiness of, yo, it's cool. <laughs> I'm a hot mess when he saved me. I'm still a hot mess now. And he's my savior. And it makes me want to be more like him. And when I fail, it's just another opportunity to celebrate the cross where he paid for it all. And to see the necessity of following everything in the scriptures. Not just what I want to follow. A lot of believers lose track of that poor in spirit. Again, what is this here to do? It's an attitude adjustment. It's an attitude adjustment. We have to read this carefully. Now, some people look at the Beatitudes wrongly. They say, oh, the Beatitudes, it's the constitution of the millennial reign when Christ returns. No. Oh, the Beatitudes, it's a Magna Carta that nations can follow to be blessed. No. It is exactly what we've just shared. It is Jesus coming on the scene, flinging the doors wide open and restoring what it means to walk in happiness, in joy, in a happiness that even the best human philosopher said, try your best, but you won't get it in this life. He's saying, no, as I move into your heart, when you make me Lord and Savior, the kingdom of God is within you. And as the kingdom of God has begun within your heart, you in your heart can begin to taste what is waiting in heaven. That's why it says in Hebrews 6, those that have tasted the powers of the world to come. That's deep. Those that have tasted the powers of the world to come. And among that power is the power <clears throat> to walk in a joy, to walk in a peace, <clears throat> to walk in the joy of Jesus and to look like him. So blessed are the poor in spirit. <clears throat> Verse 4, blessed are they that mourn. And the idea there is blessed are they that not only mourn over the world and what we see, but really that mourn over their sin. And look at the connection. One, <clears throat> it's being spiritually bankrupt. But spiritually bankrupt, why? Because you're a sinner. It makes sense that the next beatus would be blessed are those that mourn over their sin. <coughs> now here's the thing, and I have a feeling that's the last cough. Here's the thing. The Talmud, the Jewish leaders of that day, they started twisting a lot of these spiritual things. Please lean in and listen to this. Watch this. 
they began twisting a lot of this. So when they read, blessed are the poor in spirit, they turned it into, thank you so much. Oh, you're awesome. Hey, I love you, man. Come on, let's hug it out. <laughs> yes. Thank you, brother. Follow this, please. Follow this, follow this, follow this. We just read, blessed are the poor in spirit. What the Talmud, which was a commentary on the Jewish scriptures, not the scriptures, but a commentary. All churches, all believers need to beware of starting to do commentary and paraphrasing on what the Bible says. What they turn blessed are the poor in spirit into is, hey, because we came from worm food and we're going to go back to being worm food, hey, how can you really think that you're all that? It sounds spiritual at first, doesn't it? But guess what? That has no hope, no purpose in it, and no incentive to want to walk like God. But that's what the religious rulers were kicking at that time. Do you follow that? They turned the second one, blessed are they that mourn. In their day, in the Talmud, they had a saying, the more you <clears throat> bemoan your, suffer, your, your sin now, the less you'll be punished in hell. That gave no incentive to understanding the joy of having a bird taken out of your foot and being able to repent, of just having just your, your nasal passages cleared when you could just repent to God and breathe easy again. Do you see what they had done? They had twisted these virtues. Jesus is coming back and saying, this is the joyful life. But look, as we're reading this, just take a moment. What have you twisted? It can happen. And that's why the Beatitudes are an attitude check. What have you twisted? What you used to call your gift of spiritual discernment, now you're just playing critical of everything around you. And in the name of I discern something. You give zero benefit of the doubt. Everything is guilty to proven, till proven innocent. But no, that's not what the beautiful gift of the discerning of spirits looks like. So we have to even realize that just as the Jewish people had done this in his day, we can start really twisting stuff. He says, blessed are the merciful. You used to love opportunities to extend mercy. Now you extend mercy with conditions. Now in your heart, you, have, you, you got the street, three strike rule back in, back in place. You see how we ourselves can take these virtues that we once celebrated and knew so well, and then we twist them in a way? And you only have to be like a little bit better than the world and as crazy as the world is to actually seem like it's spiritual and it's not. Let's keep reading. So, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Beatus, happy beyond measure are those that learn self-control. Meek means, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. Blessed are the meek. It's actually the Greek word for when you take a stallion, which actually has the power to run through a brick wall but it's actually so much strength under control that a little toddler can ride on its back. When Jesus hung on the cross, that wasn't weakness. That was meekness. 72,000 angels were waiting to come down and dice humanity, and he wouldn't call on them. That's strength under control. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those, verse 6, that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. Are you in love? Are you still in love with extending mercy to people? Now again, this comes along to do what? One, restore that, yes, walking with God should look like joy and happiness and literally the joy of the Lord is our strength. Two, to show the bar and how high it really is. The Jewish leaders of that day were like, yo, as long as your conduct is right, it don't I mean, Jesus says, no, it's not. It doesn't matter how good your actions are. It's about your attitude. It doesn't matter how good manners you have. It's about your motives. He's showing the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. But again, the third thing is, he's making clear that you cannot do this without him. He is declaring dependence upon God as a must daily. So if you're reading this and you're like, yo, the only way I could do any of this is, is if Jesus has his way in my life. Exactly. If you're reading this and you're like, yo, I look nothing like this, then it's just supposed to get you to realize, yeah, you know something? It's because I, 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 when's the last time I really, really cr cried out for God to have his way in my life? Not just thinking it like, yeah, God, it'd be really cool. You know what? I need to get back to leaning on the Lord. No, when's the last time you really leaned on him? That's what this is here to do. And again, I know I sound like a CD with a scratch, but again, you look at the church of today 
And you look at brotherly love that's so in crisis so much. But Jesus said in the last days, because the days will be so dark and sinful, the love of believers would start to grow cold. You look at a day where finding joy, it says, I was glad when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. And you live in a day now where like people going to church is like taking out the trash. Like, man, I got to go to church. No, no, it's, it's, I get to go to church. But it's showing that just like the hearers of Jesus' day needed an attitude adjustment and needed to be reminded that this thing is about joy and about life, there are believers today who know their Bible, who know how to walk in a church and tell in 10 minutes if it's a Bible teaching church or not, that knows good stories of outreach, that has a great library, and they have no joy. No joy because they're not seeking to walk in what Jesus promises is the recipe, but you got to depend on them. You've got to do heart examination. You've got to do heart work. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Verse 8, he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are they, verse 10, that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, verse 11, when men will revile you, persecute you, will say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets which were before you. There are other beatitudes as well. He just gives 10 of them here. What about in Matthew 11, verse 6? When even John the Baptist, when Jesus didn't free him from jail, even John the Baptist, because things didn't pan out the way John the Baptist imagined in his Christian walk, he had a moment where he said, hey, go ask Jesus, is he really the Messiah or should we look for someone else? And Jesus says, blessed, beatus is he that doesn't stumble in how I do what I do when I do what I do. What about Acts chapter 20 verse 35 when Paul is giving another beatitude that Jesus must have given at another point. Acts 20 verse 35, he says, we remember the words of our Jesus who said it's more beatus, blessed to give than to receive. He's bringing that adjustment. We live in a world that says giving's cool, but yo, receiving is really where, where it's at. Isn't that what our culture communicates? And how much has that seeped into the church? Like, yo, I'll, I'll, I'll serve, man, if no one else serves. Like, let me know. <laughs> How many times you hear, yo, if, if, if no one shows up, call me. I'll be there. In the meantime, I'll be receiving from TV sources, doing what I do. But if no one shows up, I will come and give. He says, the beatus, the beatus is sacrificial living at any moment, at any time. You don't spell love, L-O-V-E. You spell love, S-A-C-R-I-F-I-C-E. That's another reason why you see such a lack of happiness in so much of Christianity today because we're drinking in the world's taker culture. A lot of people fall in the trap. They come to church, it's like a slot machine. Like, yo, I hope, I hope the sermon is three bananas. And you should come to church and want it to be three bananas because the Bible is jackpot every time. But that's it. It's like three bananas? Yo, shh, next to me, never mind your problems. I'm trying to get my three bananas. Lord, don't ask me to talk to this person after service. You know what I mean? And this too, and then the other, and that's it. It's a taker culture, a receiving culture. He said it's more blessed to give. Oh, getting three bananas from every sermon, we need that. That's how we know how to actually have the right attitude. But yo, the happiness comes from giving sacrificially. Here's a great thing for you. Do you give sacrificially? Do you give outside your comfort zone? That may be a great way for you to start and realize why divine happiness and the sense of the Father's smile on you, the way sun rays could just so grace the back of your neck, why that's void in your life. Doesn't mean you're loved any less. Doesn't mean you're less righteous. Doesn't mean that you're going to a lesser place in heaven. It just means that you're experiencing less of heavenly joy and happiness on earth, which also means that you're less attractive to an unhappy world looking for answers because you look a lot more like them. I could keep going, but I tell you what we're going to do. Let's come in next week. Are you enjoying these beatitudes? That's all about your attitude, right? Let's come in next week because next week he's going to really talk about our relationship with the world. And as we're continuing to talk about engaging culture, he's going to say, you're the salt of the earth. 
we talk about what salt does. How salt not only preserves corruption. Interestingly, salt can never reverse what's already corrupt. If you got a piece of meat and you salt it, it's not going to reverse what already happened bad to that meat. But it will prevent further corruption. As we're out in the world called to engage culture, to be in culture, saturate culture, to then take every thought captive for Christ, we're to be salt. We can't stop what's already going down. But we could prevent further corruption. Your presence, you being around, things just, the turnip's not as bananas because you're around. Things just don't go down as much because you're not around. Let's get it real. Someone doesn't get murdered because you were around. Someone doesn't get visited because you were around. You literally will see yourself, you will lower statistics because you were there. And not just physically, oh, I restrained them. No, you were there, your presence, your words, your wisdom, as you shared Christ, salt. Salt does something else. It makes people thirsty. That's why they say, well, that's why at the bar they give you salted peanuts. Because you're only going to be eating them for a little while before you start ordering something, which is where they really make their money. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right. Salt. And then he says, you're light. So we're going to talk about our relationship with the world next week, okay? But again, please reread this. Please, whatever this teaching today brought up, would you again look at this in light of Luke 6? As he was teaching this, he was healing people. As he was teaching this, he was healing diseases. As he was teaching this, he was healing, I'm sure, things that people even brought on themselves. Not just stuff people were born with, but stuff people got because they were just living foul. He was manifesting healing grace as he was giving this weighty thing. What was he communicating? I'm here. You can't heal yourself of these things. That's why I'm healing you. You can't live this unless you let me do it through you. So a proper reading of this, one, brings your attitude back. Two, helps you self-diagnose why you might just be a Christian that looks like you eat lemons every day. You don't look like you eat honey. It says, how good is your word? Sweeter than honey to my mouth. You don't look like you eat honey. You look like you eat lemons, lemon juice, and the peel. And the white part in between the meat and the peel. That's what you look like. This comes along and says, here's why. Be attitudes. It's it's about your attitude. It's an attitude adjustment. But may you also feel led to really talk and talk and really have a convo with God because you're realizing, wow, you were healing everybody while you were doing this. You were making everyone able to get it. Lord, help me get this. Help me get this. And then, Lord, would you do this through me? Would you please do this through me? Would you change me? And honestly, what is this? It's looking like Jesus. You know what every worldview has in common? What every worldview has in common is that they all hold Jesus as the dynamic person to walk the earth, the ideal person to walk the earth. Even an atheist will have nothing wrong to say about any of the wisdom and the love and the sacrifice and the living of Jesus. They're wrong with what they assess of him as far as who he is. Every religion tries to claim him. The Muslims say he's a prophet. The Buddhists say he's one of the ascended masters. The New Agers say that he ushers in the Aquarian age and it's the spirit of Christ, not really him bodily, but the essence of all that he stands for. We as Christians, we just actually just believe what he says about himself. So it ain't what the Christians say about Jesus. No, we just actually believe what he said. That he said that he's God. That he said he's Emmanuel. That he said he is the Alpha and the Omega. That he says that Judgment Day is all in his hands. That he has the authority only to forgive sins. And that if he doesn't wash you, you will not go to heaven. We just believe what he says about himself. So let's celebrate Jesus. Let's celebrate Jesus. And remember they said, Jesus... Just, you've done so much, John 14. Show us the Father now. Show us the Father and that'll be the cherry on top. He said in John 14, Philip, you don't get it. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So on this Father's Day, all of what we've just seen Jesus do, just stand in awe of your Father, of your Heavenly Father. Because if you've seen Him, if in this sermon today, in these readings of Scripture, you've seen Him, You've seen the Father. This is the Father. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time, this gathering. And Lord, we we need this. In a day where the dizziness, the dizzy, intoxicating culture of this day has everyone's head spinning. 
Even we, all the more in the church, need your word to anchor us, to settle us, to sober us up, to recalibrate us. Thank you so much for inventing church, for inventing the pulpit, and inventing the teaching of your word so that we could be recalibrated by your spirit. We repent, Lord, of wrong thinking. We repent of just putting attitude, examination on back burner. We, we repent of just being churchy. It's easy to do. Thanks for bringing us back to what it's about and showing us once again that we truly have tasted the heavenly powers to come. We want to come back to our first love, like it says in Revelation. Please bring us back. Please heal us where we need healing. Please deliver us where we need delivering. We love that while you taught this, you were healing and touching and meeting needs, giving everyone what they didn't deserve. Would you today give us what we don't deserve, Lord? Would you today give us what we don't deserve in thinking and doing and feeling and understanding? Would you give us what we don't deserve? A healing touch? Draw us, Lord. We've been a lot of places, we've seen a lot of faces, and we just always come back. There's nothing, no one like you, no teaching like your teaching, no life like your life, no word like your word. So Lord, here we are. We love you. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're now going to worship.